In this work, we introduce single-level differentiable contact simulation. We start off by describing a simple contact dynamics scenario. We want to simulate a sphere making contact with the ground. The sphere has radius r, and it's located at altitude z. The sine distance function phi is equal to z minus r. To simulate this system forward in time by one time step, we can formulate a nonlinear complementarity problem, or NCP. We want to find z plus, the position of the sphere at the next time step, phi, the sine distance function, and gamma, the impact force. Those quantities have to respect a few constraints. The first constraint contains the free-floating dynamics of the sphere. z is the position of the sphere at the current time step, and z minus is the position of the sphere at the previous time step. We also have a gravity term, and we also factor in the impact force. This constraint is the contact dynamics constraint. We also have one additional constraint, which encodes the analytic expression of the sine distance function. And finally, we have one complementarity constraint. Phi times gamma is equal to zero, phi and gamma positive. This encodes the binary switching behavior between being in contact and not being in contact. To illustrate this, we have two scenarios. The first case is when phi is larger than zero, gamma has to be zero. So when the sphere is not in contact with the ground, the contact force has to be null. When gamma is positive, then phi has to be equal to zero. This means that when you have a non-zero contact force, the sphere has to be in contact with the ground. So we've seen how to simulate one time step. If you repeat this operation and solve this nonlinear complementarity problem multiple times, you can simulate the sphere forward in time and you get the result on the right. The sphere lands on the ground and doesn't interpenetrate with the ground. To solve this NCP, we use a primal dual entail point method. So we have seen how to simulate a very simple system with no friction, just impact forces, and a simple analytical sine distance function. However, in some cases, we don't have access to an analytical expression for the sine distance function. In such cases, we can resort to optimization-based collision detection. So if you have two shapes like this, and you want to find the sine distance function between those two shapes, you can solve an optimization problem, such as this one. You want to find a scaling factor alpha and a contact point P, uh, such that P belongs to shape one, a scaled version of shape one, and P belongs to uh, the scaled version of shape two. And you want to find the smallest scaling factor alpha that will have both shape intersect. So in this case, the smallest scaling factor alpha is going to be 1.5. And the contact point P will be located at the intersection of those two scaled version of shape one and shape two. So this is how the scaling works. Um, if we choose a scaling factor alpha between zero and two, uh, at alpha is equal to zero, both shapes are reduced to a single point. When alpha is equal to one, both shapes are respecting their original dimensions. And when alpha is equal to two, both shapes are twice as big. So if we look into what this optimization-based collision detection is doing when the two shapes are separated, uh, we get this uh, uh, scenario. The scaling factor is going to be increased up to something around 1.5. And at this point, you have contact between the two shapes and you can select the contact point. The sine distance function is going to be equal to alpha minus one. And as you can see, because the two objects are separated, the sine distance function will be positive. When the two shapes are overlapping, we need to scale both shapes down to reduce the intersection to a single point. In this case, the scaling factor is smaller than one and the sine distance function is negative as expected. So these are graphical interpretation of the optimization-based collision detection. In practice, to solve this optimization problem, we use a primal dual interpoint point method and we write down the KKT conditions. I'm not going to dive too much into the details of these equations, 
but these are the KKT conditions. We have primal optimization variables, dual variables, slack variables. And we have also primal optimality constraints, slack constraints, and complementarity constraints. When we solve the collision detection problem, we are interested in three quantities. The first one is the contact location, P. And we have access to this uh, quantity because we have solved for it because it's an optimization variable. The second one is the sine distance function phi. It's equal to 1 uh, to alpha minus 1. So we also have access to it after we solve uh, this optimization problem. And the last one is the contact normal n. And this can be obtained by differentiating through this optimization problem. We will see how to do this very efficiently using the dual variables. So the contact normal can be obtained by differentiating the sine distance function. So say we have those two shapes, they are in contact, and shape 1 is located at position x1, and shape 2 is located at position x2. The contact point location p is located here, and we have n1 and n2, the contact normals for both shapes. So n1 is going to be proportional to the gradient of phi with respect to x1. And it has a nice closed form solution in terms of the dual variables lambda1. The same is true for uh, n2. And actually computing those um, contact normals is extremely simple because these quantities have been computed when solving for the KKT conditions. Here we visualize the result of the optimization-based collision detection. We visualize the contact point location as well as the contact normal and the contact tangent. As you can see, the contact point location is defined uh, when both objects are in contact, when they are separated, and when they are overlapping. The contact normal also points in the outward direction in uh, all of these three cases. So even when you have overlap or even when you are not in contact, the contact normal is well defined. So we have seen how to perform collision detection between a pair of convex shapes. We can do this uh, with more complex shapes by combining convex primitives through union operations or Minkowski sum. And this is the result that we get when we simulate those more complex shapes. To combine optimization-based collision detection and contact dynamics, a bi-level formulation has been proposed. In this formulation, the upper-level problem is solving the contact dynamics problem. We are trying to find the next configuration Z+, plus and the impact force gamma, subject to a few constraints. The first one contains the free-floating dynamics and the impact forces mapped into the generalized coordinate through this impact Jacobian. This impact Jacobian depends on P star and N star. P star is the contact point location and N star is the contact normal. All of this um, forms the contact dynamics. And then we have additional complementary constraints. Phi star times gamma is equal to zero, phi star and gamma being positive quantities. P star, N star, and phi star are the contact point position, contact normal, and the sine distance function obtained by solving the optimization-based collision detection problem. The lower level problem in this bi-level formulation is the collision detection. We solve the same collision detection problem as we've seen before, and when we do the solve, we obtain the sine distance function phi star, the contact point location P star, and if we differentiate this optimization problem, we can obtain the contact normal n star. This formulation is very simple and appealing. However, it can break in certain scenarios. We are going to illustrate this with a very simple example. So on the bottom left, you have two shapes and the contact point is P. As you can see, with a slight change of configuration of relative pose of the two objects, you get a large change in terms of contact point location. So the contact point location is actually a discontinuous function of the configuration of the system. 
Because of this, when you formulate the KKT conditions for the upper level problem, and you try to solve for the, the root of those KKT conditions, you are actually trying to find the root of a set of discontinuous functions. And applying Newton's method in this case is going to be very tricky, because Newton's method typically works well when the functions are continuous and twice differentiable. So the bilevel formulation uh, can work well uh, in certain scenarios when you have vertex-to-phase contact or vertex-to-vertex -vertex contact. However, for phase-to-phase uh, -phase contact, because you have this discontinuity in the contact point location, the solver for the upper level problem really struggles to find uh, the correct solution. And because of this, the simulation breaks. So to fix those issues, we introduced the single level formulation. It's a very simple idea. We formulate one single optimization problem that combines the contact dynamics and the collision detection. So we are forming one single optimization problem where we are optimizing over um, a set of variables that contains the contact dynamics variables and the collision detection variables. And those variables are subject to the contact dynamics constraints, the expressions for the sine distance function and the contact normal, as well as the KKT conditions for the collision detection problem. If you look at the simulation on the right, we can accurately simulate face-to-face uh, -face contact uh, between several blocks. What we are optimizing here at each time step is not only the contact forces, the friction forces, but also uh, the contact point location, the sine distance functions, the contact normals, everything all at once. The intuition behind why the single level formulation outperforms the bilevel formulation is that we are only optimizing over continuous functions. We've done a few comparisons between the single level and the bilevel formulations. Here we just have a simple block stacking scenario. On the left, we have the single level formulation. It works as expected. You can see the contact point location as well as the contact normals for each of the blocks. On the right, you have the bilevel formulation, and it really struggles when there is face to face contact. We have compared the two approaches in terms of accuracy. We measured the momentum error for a simple scenario, and we have found that the single level formulation is on average uh, 10 times more accurate. We have also done some comparison in terms of reliability, comparing how many times the solver was failing for the bi-level formulation versus the single level formulation. And the single level formulation fails about 0.1% of the time compared to 50% of the time for the bi-level formulation. Finally, we have done some speed comparison between the single level and the bi-level formulations. The single level formulation is about 30 times faster than the bi-level formulation. This is mainly because the single level formulation solves the contact dynamics problem and the collision detection problem only once and jointly, whereas the bi-level formulation has to solve many, many times the same collision detection problem. We have applied this single level formulation of contact dynamics in the robotics manipulation context. With the single level formulation, we can smoothly differentiate through contact interaction, such as impact and friction, but also smoothly differentiate the contact normals and the contact point location. We've applied it to simple tasks like displacing, rotating, and lifting objects to a desired location. We've done this with non-convex objects trying to reach a desired location. Our method does have some limitations. First, the interpoint point method used to solve the NCP is difficult to warm start. It is a well-known limitation of interpoint point methods. In the simulation context, reusing the solution obtained at the previous time step to warm start the solver can deliver huge computational gains. We have implemented a simple warm starting strategy. This strategy significantly cuts down the solve times, however, it slightly decreases uh, the reliability of the solver further investigation would be necessary to provide a more robust warm starting strategy. The second limitation is that the method yields a single contact point between a pair of convex objects. 
and therefore torsional friction is not modeled. Including torsional friction would require adding a scalar inequality constraint to the contact dynamics problem. Finally, we plan to leverage the differentiability of the contact formulation to integrate it into policy optimization and predictive control frameworks. We will also explore broad phase collision detection because detecting and pruning out inactive collision pairs can further speed up simulation times. Finally, extending the Julia implementation to PyTorch or JAX would enable highly parallelized contact simulation with GPU support. Finally, I would like to thank my co-authors on this work, Max Schweger at Stanford, Zachary Manchester, Vikas, Pete and Samit at Google Brain Robotics.